in it, and yet the rest of the house, it's just because there's no heat getting to it from the house because it's so well insulated. So I've had to, to kind of rationalise my thoughts and bring stuff down into the main body of the house, which is thrilling my other half, as you can imagine. I'd like to, okay, I've allowed people five minutes uh, and what I'm going to do uh, is to uh, share the screen in a moment. Okay, and uh, we'll start and um, I will uh, mute everybody uh, and uh, yeah. And uh, we'll also have um, chat. So if you wish to put stuff in chat, and just get that going. Okay, there's a chat thing at the side. And now uh, I'll go to share screen and this is the start, okay. Okay, and this will start the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, everybody, um, just uh, to, um, uh, say tonight, oh yeah, here we are, one more to admit. Uh, I'm talking about a project that um, the society has been involved in for several years uh, with the prospect of producing a book at the end of it. And my good, uh, several of the people who are on uh, Zoom tonight have been involved in this particular uh, project. Eventually we will get the thing published, but of course things being as they are at the moment, this is a bit of a no-no. But uh, if you like to put any questions that you have in chat, please, uh, please do so. Uh, and I'll pick them up at the end. So here we start with one of the standard things about doing research. Um, research takes many uh, different forms and here uh, you've uh, got a couple of maps of Clydesdale. One issued by Timothy Pont in 1596. Timothy Pont, for those people who uh, don't know anything about him, was a, a minister who traveled around Scotland uh, in the 1580s, 1590s, recording all the places and annotating everything and putting uh, detail on the maps. If you uh, look uh, at the map on your left in the screen, it shows bigger and it shows fairly accurate depiction of uh, bulk all look bigger, but also it shows another uh, tower, which is also uh, nearby. And I'm a bit mystified by, by this. Um, and it is these little bits of detail about the old tower houses and so on, which Timothy Pont uh, noted down. And uh, he gave some degree of detail, which is absent from the Dutch map by Johannes Blau, uh, which dates to about 50 years later in 1645. But the thing about uh, Blau's map is that it is much more commercial, it is much neater, uh, there's some entertaining uh, 
Dutch interpretations of place names where it couldn't read uh, what Timothy Pont had written. But certainly it is of great interest. Um, Blau's maps were international and his maps actually had uh, a very wide circulation and even ended up um, being uh, exported to the Arab world. He had one version of his atlas which had Arabic on the back of the maps. Absolutely amazing character. But anyway, we're going back into uh, some of the bits of prehistory that uh, we've uh, been involved in here. You can see people on their knees at Bigger Common looking for flints and pottery and so on. Bigger Common is definitely uh, a place that merits a place in the cabinet of curiosities because on Bigger Common, Tam Ward, who you see standing over, supervising everything on the far right here, he found here with his volunteers round about a quarter of a ton of late Neolithic pottery, which is a record for uh, Scotland. But not only did they find Neolithic pottery, but also early um, Bronze Age pottery. On the left here, you can see <coughs> from a can what um, is known to us as beakerware, but on the con continent as linear band ceram ceramic because of the lines across the pot. Underneath, there's some uh, tools made out of flint. Some of this actually comes from the East Riding of Yorkshire. Roman stuff has always been important to us. And here is a uh, aerial photograph, which I took a number of years ago of a fort near Lanark. It is called um, Castle Dykes. Um, it is of considerable uh, interest because um, it uh, shows, uh, shows us the uh, the scale of the Roman occupation here in Scotland. We have been field walking here for over oh, 30 odd years and found quite a lot of stuff. In the picture here, you see the uh, main camp, which is about eight and a half acres and beyond it, um, you see um, the uh, areas where um, show you uh, show you there. Um, these are the areas where they stored their wagons and so on. Uh, the traders would come to these areas and get safe lodging for the night. Over down to the right underneath the bit about uh, talking, by this tree we found the remains of a bathhouse and just recently we found uh, part of the lead from the uh, coal bath of this bathhouse. Uh, it wasn't known about until we did work there. Now, I want just to dwell on one thing here. There's quite a lot of history to this place, but I'm not able to go into that tonight. But about... 30 years ago, uh, several late Roman coins were found here, including one like this, a Maiorina of the Emperor Valentinian I. Valentinian I uh, 
uh, was around about uh, 370 AD. Uh, it was uh, in his reign that Count Theodosius came into Scotland to deal with the Picts who have been causing a lot of trouble to the Romans. <coughs> uh, came to suppress what they call the barbarian conspiracy. And the coins of Valentinian and uh, Grace, um, Gratian and Procopius, an indication that the uh, Romans stayed, uh, stayed here in the fourth century. Many people assumed that indeed uh, the Romans left uh, Scotland for good um, round about the time of Severus um, after his son Caracalla concluded a peace treaty with the Picts. But that is certainly a point of interest. We also have links in uh, with the history of the early church. And this here uh, shows the aerial photograph, shows a bit of what might be a dark age uh, place in Hamilton in the High Parks. We know that Hamilton or Cadsall was a place where the kings of Strathclyde lived, including Redesh Hale. Connected with Redesh Hale in the late sixth century was a, a guy who was called St. Kentigan. Um, and here you see uh, St. Kentigan, uh, but it's a fantasy portrait. Uh, done in the 19th century. Over on the left-hand side, uh, you see uh, a prayer, uh, it was uh, oh, a missal relating to um, the Priory of Les Maiga, which was a Tyrannensian foundation. This is quite an interesting uh, book um, it's the earliest survival, uh, surviving missile in southern Scotland, and uh, it had to be bought back from England for the price of 150 quid in 1950. On the extreme right is a the remains of a reliquary illustrated in the uh, a book called the um, history of the upper ward of Lanarkshire by Irving and Murray, and it shows the uh, remains of an arm bone reliquary connected with the other person mentioned here called St. Makut, who is related to Les Maiga. And incidentally, Les Maiga is named after this particular saint. Um, Ecclese uh, Makut became Les Maiga of the centuries. The arm bone is interesting because originally this reliquary had gold and so on on it. We know that it costs well over two pounds uh, of gold coins to be decorated in the reign of Mary Queen of Scots by the famous jeweler John Mossman, who lived in what we now call John Knox's house. Here is a view of the present church of Les Maigo, um, which was built down on top of the remains of the priory. Some people call it an abbey, it certainly wasn't an abbey. Um, it's interesting because this priory, founded in the uh, early part of the 12th century, <coughs> lies slap bang 
on top of the remains of a Kaldi monastery, which goes back at least to the 10th century, because during the excavations here, remains of the monks were found. This here is actually on the right, the excavated remains of the monks' solarium, which lay underneath the refectory. In the excavation, a key was found, a key um, for, um, for one of the barrels. Um, so it's quite interesting that this spigot should have been found in the excavations, along with a lot of other things such as coinage and so on. Well, it's not only the excavated stuff that we look at, but also we trawl through what is produced by the Royal Commission. And here, um, this is the remains of a <coughs> old house at Carnois. And this house um, had part of it dated back to the 16th century. And one of uh, the uh, things that was found uh, was this cellar, which dates back to the early part of the 16th century. Quite an interesting place. It was connected with the Jacobites one time, one of the Lockarts who lived in here latterly. Um, they actually joined the cause of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Here is a 18th century picture of a place near Lanark, which is not in the condition as it was in the 18th century when Paul Sandby, who was a member of the Royal Academy, drew this rather nice picture near the uh, Cora Falls, uh, Cora Lynn. Um, not only did he draw the castle, which is interesting, but he also drew uh, the picture of a mill. The mill probably disappeared <coughs> in the um, late 18th century when there was a massive flood. Talking about old houses and interesting ones, <coughs> here we have uh, a picture of Lee Castle as it looked before Gillespie Graham redesigned Lee Castle as it is today. Parts of this house which you see, which were built by Cromwell uh, Lockett, son of Lockett, who was the um, Secretary of State for Cromwell in Scotland, parts of this building still survive to this day. The other interesting thing about this is the statue of the Fawn that entered up at Cleghorn. And I think Richard Lockhart sold this. This statue of a fawn is a really interesting piece of 17th century, um, uh, of 17th century sculpture. Lee Castle is also associated, yes, as the modern Lee Castle, you see with the story of the Lee Penny. <coughs> the Lee Penny um, is actually a groat, and on it is a semi-precious stone. It is alleged that one of the Lockarts got it on a crusade in Spain for 
sparing one of the um, the daughter of a uh, Arab doctor uh, from the attentions of the Scottish soldiers, and in gratitude he gave uh, Sir Simon Locker this. Simon Locker was in Spain because of the um, he was in Spain because he was involved with taking Bruce's heart on a crusade. This was after Bruce died in 1330. That is why I put this uh, type of armor on, which is taken from an English brass, to give you an idea of how he might have been equipped. The Lee Penny was used at last apparently in 1914. It was supposed to have magical properties. What happened was somebody cut their hand on a can and bled profusely. And so the then lockout got this out of the uh, out of the place where it was stored at the house. Uh, and gave trois dips and a swell and some water, thrust the guy's hand in, and lo and behold, the bleeding stopped. And next day, uh, nobody uh, could, uh, no mark could be seen. Now, one of the finest early medieval sites we've got is the Mott at Carnwath, which is in the middle of a, um, a golf course. On top of this Mott, there's a sort of depression, and some people have postulated that the mop was built round a stone tower. Um, could be, but the problem is the golf course has ruined the uh, works round about it, which is a bit of a nuisance. This belonged to the Somerville family who came from Normandy in the 12th century. Carstairs, near Carnwath, has <coughs> used to have a fine medieval church, which was paid for by the bishops of Glasgow. So here you see uh, a bit of a corbel, which um, is in a special display cabinet in the church, and outside of bits and pieces of medieval vaulting, most of the church or the surviving bits of sculpture suggest the bishops of Glasgow did a complete refurb of this church, which belonged to them around about the middle of the 15th century. So it was interesting collecting old prints, and here you have two old prints. These are relating to bigger. One is of the uh, old church of St. Mary's, and it doesn't have all the modern bits and pieces on it. And it dates back this view to the 19th century. The church is interesting because the chancel was the last <coughs> uh, 16th century pre-Reformation church to be constructed in Scotland. If you look on the right, you'll see the remains of uh, Boghall Castle. Uh, <coughs> much of that disappeared. Um, 
written in the 19th century and only bits of the towers uh, survive. Uh, these date about 1580 and you see a building at the back which built about um, 1680. I dug here with a team of uh, kids from the local school and we found remains of the gatehouse that you see. <coughs> here, um, talking about churches again, see a rather interesting aisle which belongs to uh, a collegiate church which once existed in the village of Conworth, again built by the Somervilles. Uh, a lot of it was reshaped in the 19th century. Uh, and I just wonder how much of the roof was totally replaced. But the window that you see on the right is an example more of the English perpendicular style of architecture. It's always interesting to look at um, the old houses uh, around Lanark which disappeared. And there is a guy called Scott who did a lot of views of old houses that have disappeared. And Bonington is part of the area not far from um, New Lanark. And on the left is Admiral Sir John Lockhart Ross, who built the house that you can see in the, in the print. This was much altered there by the time it caught fire in the early part of the 20th century. Robert Owen was um, connected with houses and this area and here we see picture of Braxfield House. Uh, most of it's been uh, demolished. And this site is uh, really under threat. Uh, at the moment, somebody has taken over the estate and the future of the ruins of this house where Owen stayed um, in the early part of the 19th century are sub say we don't know what's going to happen. But what I would say is Owen was not the only famous person to be connected with Braxfield. Indeed, a person called McQueen, who was known as the Hanging Judge, who sold the land which formed the basis of New Lanark. He lived here. Uh, judge McQueen was known as the Hanging Judge, and <clears throat> he was the senior judge in Scotland. And woe betide anybody bought before him because he would say, well, um, he would uh, drink a lot of port. And in those days, cases were resolved in a day. And if the case dragged on too much, he got more and more maudlin to the extent that if you plead your case too long, you stood a chance of being hung. This is connected with the Bollington estate again. And um, this, uh, this little road that you see going down here and the line of trees is connected with a thing called uh, Lady Mary's Walk. Uh, this was put in place in the early 19th century by Lady Mary Ross and it goes to a farm called Robbie's Land. It's quite a nice walk to do. Um, the thing 
this whole ditch thing, which you see in this photograph, may be part of a um, park pail. Park pail was used uh, for deer to make sure the deer stayed in the park of Bonington so that they could be hunted. One of the uh, things about uh, Bonington uh, and area, Bonington has a power station and it was part of a way in the 20s of harnessing the falls applied to produce electricity. Just recently, these hydro stations have been uh, refurbed uh, about eight years after they were installed. They were in their day um, a great issue because people didn't want the falls to be, the vista of the falls to be affected in any way. So it's the first great environmental controversy. Going around uh, <coughs> Clydesdale, one comes across things such as this. This is the Gardener's Gate, made by the local blacksmith at Douglas Castle, or at least it was there. This property belonged to the Earls of Home, of whom many of you will have heard of Sir Alec Douglas Home. And Sir Alec, um, well, maybe his, maybe he, took this gate away from here to the other place where the Humes lived, which is in the borders in Berwickshire, which is called the Herschel. <coughs> Local industrialists played an important part in the history of our, our area. And here you see Ockenheath House. Now Ockenheath House was in its day quite a, a modern affair. It was built for a great industrialist called James Ferguson, who owned a number of coal mines near Ockenheath. These produced a specific type of coal called camel coal, which heats up readily and produces gas. Now we're coming on to having a look at some of the wee bits and pieces that we've done in the past. And this is the late 80s. Uh, the girl that you can see in the jeans in the middle there uh, is Wendy Farling, who went on to uh, work in Rugby Town Museum. And it was at rugby school that I was educated. Anyway, I met Wendy about four years ago, and she's doing a life of an antiquarian called Bloxham. Well, that's not the point of this picture. We we're excavating in a house next uh, down the Bloom Gate, next to the Crowstep Gable House that lies a back a bit from the road. And this one time was um, the head teacher's house because the Crowstep Gable building was at one time a school in the 17th century. Later it became a poorhouse, and one of the things that we found in an excavation was 
a beggar's badge which took the form of a thistle. Further back, however, he found the a key which dated back to the 15th century, still with its original lock. One of the greatest digs that we did in the past 20 odd years was 1999 next to um, the Clydesdale Inn. And here you see a bit of the wall of the 14th century. Um, Greyfriars Friary, um, which was modified in the 15th century. And we found evidence when we were digging in this wall of the first piped water in Lanark's history, a piece of lead piping. On the right here, you can see some of the pottery of the 13th century. It is alleged that the, the friary was founded by Robert the Bruce in 1329. I thought you would be interested in some of the old um, photographs of Lanark, this is about 1870, it's before there was even um, the fountain which was put up in the 1880s, but it is a really early photograph of uh, Main Street, the High Street in Lanark, and look at the thatched building in the corner there. Um, Uh, which dates back to the 17th century. The very interesting bits and pieces here. And some of you will remember Janice's shop, which used to be here. And that, um, that uh, date um, has a date stone 1688. Here we're in uh, a late, much later period, uh, we're in the sort of early 1900s. This bit here was later to be developed for a public toilet. Um, and many people have expressed the opinion that the public toilet should be dug out and um, refurbished. We dug inside St. Nicholas in um, 1999. We found in uh, the main part of the nave, we found the remains we can see here and here. I'll go back. Um, we found remains of the old of pillars which were one of the uh, alterations made to St Nicholas in 1570 by Thomas Tudhope. You see at the far end the remains of the entrance to the church. The church in Lark is, uh, I don't know whether it's unique but there aren't many churches in Scotland which have their altar at the wrong end, i.e. the west. This was partly because the council uh, wanted the tower for themselves. They put up in 1774 some of the money to build the present church. And that was the deal. And the council still own it not the common good, as they will always tell you, but that is actually totally untrue. Here you see some remains which were found by guard during the excavation work by the 
entrance to the church. We just dug in the nave section and we found some old uh, mortuary pins and we found some uh, medieval pottery. One of the places that's always been my second home is the Clydesdale Inn, especially on a Tuesday. I do so miss my Tuesday point. That's probably why my voice sounds so froggy. Um, but um, the Clydesdale Inn started in the 1790s. It was built by the local gentleman of the area for 700 pounds sterling. Bits were added to it, like the um, assembly room you see here when it was being done up in the 1999, the remains of the assembly room. This was put in in 1820, sometime after Wordsworth. Coleridge visited the inn. Uh, some of the windows of the bedrooms still have glass in them dating back to that visit. Um, Coleridge and Wordsworth and Wordsworth's sister stayed in the hotel and visited the Falls of Clyde. There were one a number of visitors who stayed here, including Charles Dickens. Uh, being involved in archaeology uh, and local history sometimes brings you into conflict with uh, vested interests in Lanark. Here we see a nice picture of the station square and bits of the Royal Oak. Um, I took the matter up with Historic Environment Scotland and they've got the facade preserved. The developers don't like me for this. <laughs> and, uh, but you sometimes have to fight these battles and it is important. Like this one here, 43 High Street, uh, <coughs> might not look much for a building, but I'm pretty sure once the Harling is stripped off and the interior is stripped, that we have a building dating back to the 17th century with 18th century additions. By the way, those of you who uh, might be interested to know that the number of cars you see here are roughly the number of extra cars that will be available with the new car park created once this building is demolished for the cost of £276,000. Now, if you think that that's good value, then I'm a Chinaman. But here we are. Uh, uh, but I shall always keep fighting for what I believe to be important about our heritage and good value for public money. We have some uh, interesting characters relating to Lanark, of which there are very many, but perhaps the most famous is a guy called Loglas Will, who was a famous, famous um, traveler. And um, here you see an uh, illustration out of the book, his autobiography the painful peregrinations of William Lithgow Esquire. He lived in the early part of the 17th century. He was called Loveless Will. He lost his ears because he was involved in <coughs> having sex with some, um, with um, a sister to uh, some of the Lockhart's, one of the uh, noble families here in Lanark, 
uh, the brothers found them uh, having sex, pulled him off and cut off his ears and put him out of the borough. Um, the map here on the right is the Blau map. It is thought that when he died, he was actually buried here in Lanark. He would have known this building that's in the center. It's called Hindford House. And that was built in 1618. About the time that he actually left, he spent a lot of years wandering around Europe, the Balkans, Near East and North Africa. His book is well worth a read. Not a close person connected with Lanark is Wallace. This wall is away now. I did some digging here, but I found no remains of um, a house connected with Wallace. Indeed, it's, he didn't have a house here. He would have stayed in Lanark briefly while he was um, traveling uh, around the, uh, while he was uh, traveling around the, um, around Scotland. It was on the 3rd of May, 1297, that he uh, started his rebellion off against the English rule here in Lanark. And you see an interesting cinema here, which is called the Rio, which long since disappeared. Next to it is a house called Via House, which had inside it the remains of a 16th century house and belong to the Veers Blackwood. And the dog here was put up to look at Veer House because the person who had this dog thought that uh, a guy who lived here in this house killed it. So the dog was put up to look reproachfully at Veer House. The dog won because Beer House is now a little supermarket. That is another story. These are some uh, adverts, which are really interesting and gives us a glimpse into the old way of doing things. Um, Michael Johnson, extreme right, is now a barber's, and underneath Michael Johnson were found some bones which belonged to the cemetery of St. Nicholas. No doubt many of you remember the old style shops. Well, here's the Les Mahiga uh, Co-op in about 1900, 1910. And you see the big canisters which had had a tea or coffee in them. And uh, the old weighing machines and so on. And in the back here, you can see a couple of delivery boys these were this was the way things were when I grew up in Yorkshire and Pontefract. My good friend Eric will remember the Vox, Vox brothers who had a, a traditional grocers and the maple dairy where you got pats of butter. Oh my goodness. Not, Modern supermarkets are soulless places. These were vibrant, interesting places. And I remember my mum used to, when she 
bought groceries used one of these wicker work uh, baskets. And of course we got our groceries delivered. And this is one of the things in those days. Uh, you know, uh, horses have always been sort of synonymous, I suppose, with Clydesdale. And here we see uh, an advert of Prentice of Carluc. Uh, he advertised wi widely throughout the United Kingdom for horse gear. And this particular uh, card was even distributed in London. Well, weather. Oh, we've had it so hard recently. Well, get a life. Here is what weather is about. See this, 1913. You can't see the damn train because of the snow. That is it, the snowplow. Wow, what a photograph. I, we don't know how how lucky we are. Uh, we have had some snowfalls, but nothing quite like this. Well, how about rain? Oh, this is quite an interesting one. They had, in a very short space of time, there was a flood in Carstairs on August the 8th, 1915. Some parts of the village were flooded to the depth of eight feet, believe it or not. And here, leisure at Lanark Lock, winter, curling. Not me many times in, in recent times that we've had curling on Lanark Lock. I uh, thought you would like this card of the early part of the 19th century. And summertime, here we have people rowing in the loch. This is you know, typical gear of the uh, Edwardian era. They're out in the Sunday best, and one guy has even got a proper top hat on. But all human life is here. Notice no social distancing in those days. <coughs> Life was very tough, of course. Um, 1919, it was the great pandemic. And my grandfather was a GP in Pontefract, and he had to go and visit all his patients, which he duly did, plus the barracks, as he was the MO. But he survived and he was still practicing the age of 78, doing half, uh, half a shift. Uh, absolutely amazing, some of the people. These, these days, you know, people retiring at the age of 50, that wasn't an option in those days because my grandfather died before the creation of the National Health Service, which he was would have been very keen on. But, you know, social life, you know, an expedition to the loch was, for some of them, like going on a summer holiday, because in these days, ordinary working people had very little money. And here's some, uh, again, uh, most communities had Culling ponds, and here's one, Abington and Crawford, and there is a uh, bowling club. Uh, this is the Douglas Bowling Club. Uh, they became very popular. I don't know if many of you know, but one of the earliest bowling clubs in the whole of Scotland is the Lanark Thistle, I think it's the Thistle the one which is on the castle uh, mound, and that goes back to the 18th century, believe it or not. Now, flick over to something else. Here's 
uh, a gold bonnet piece made out of Lead Hills gold, which has a slightly orange, um, yellow appearance. And here you see this map of the 1820s, which shows you uh, the where the gold was found on the road down towards Alvin Foot. Uh, the great period for finding gold up in the Lead Hills area, the Glengola, was round about uh, the, the early 1500s. Um, it is said that uh, James the Fifth entertained the French ambassador at Crawford and the dessert was a product of the countryside and it came in um, like cups which come with cloth and the cups were full of these bonnet pieces. You have one of these now, I think they're worth about £12,000, something like that. So if you're lucky enough to get one. Lead mining. Here we see uh, some pictures. They're quite rare, actually, of cards of lead mining. Uh, lead mining was done around Lead Hills um, from about the 17th century. They stopped looking for gold. Um, yes, lead mining does have its origins, believe it or not, way back in the 12th century when the monks of New Battle Abbey went prospecting for lead up in this area. Uh, lead mining continued up until about 1950, uh, but the heyday of it was probably about the 1860s. The, if you're ever up in Lead Hills, do go and visit the Lead Hills Library, where you'll see the bargain books where the miners agreed to uh, dig out so much lead. One of the things uh, about Lead Hills is the number of interesting characters who were, film, who were photographed by W.H. Scott, who was a native of Lead Hills. And on the right, you see old Meg, Margaret Hislop, who worked in the Hopeton Arms. Her job was, uh, she was a skivvy, she worked uh, mucking out the stables at the back of the hotel for those and such as those, as you see on the left here, I think it's one of the uh, her, Lady Oakton and some of some of her family or friends visiting, uh, looking at the sheep dipping uh, at Lead Hills. Again, this was filmed, photographed by W.H. Scott. Well, we come to some more modern times, so gradually and slowly. And here we see the Lanarkshire Yeomanry in action. Well, in one photograph, but not in the others. Here, the guys are learning the fine arts of camel riding at the pyramids, because these guys are going to go to Palestine, and they are going to have to swap the horses for camels, which came as a bit of a shock to them. This was probably after the abortive attack at Gallipoli, which the Lanarkshire uh, participated in. And on the right, this is the final uh, major action of the yeomanry. Uh, they are advancing 
towards the L bar. This is May, I think May the 3rd, 1945, just before uh, peace was uh, in Europe was declared. And this was some of the toughest fighting they had, apart from what they had endured in Italy. One of the things which, uh, one of the things that uh, people had to, um, in one of the most important things was the contribution made by the Poles. Poles were fantastic people. As a country, we betrayed the Poles who we went to war for in 1939, because they were not allowed to take part in the victory celebrations. This was because, despite the fact we had the atom bomb, we were afraid of offending Stalin. Uh, we didn't stand up to that dictator, the evil Stalin. But anyway, here we see some of the Poles who were driven out of um, uh, their homeland in 1940. They were very popular in uh, Douglas and other areas where they were. They even had a, a Polish school at East End near Carmichael. They also um, had a special meeting with General Sikorsky, who uh, is one of the seated figures here at, at Bigger. Um, Sikorsky was a very able leader. There's always a question whether poor old General Sikorsky was murdered. Uh, that's another issue altogether. One of the bravest things about the Poles was their contribution at the Monte, Monte Cassino. The Poles and Gurkhas really took Monte Cassino. Um, uh, plus, at Monte Cassino, they had a bear with them who they had acquired uh, from Iran uh, as a cub. Uh, it liked beer and six. Its name was Vodjek. It did visit Clydesdale at one point, but chiefly stayed in the borders after the war. Uh, the Poles took it into a pub. Uh, it was take, uh, I think this uh, was not in Berwick, it was uh, the one where you go from to the Bass Rock. Anyway, they took it into the pub there and uh, the guys thought, oh, this is somebody dressed up as a bear. And when they realized it was for real, they fled the pub, but later were persuaded to go back in. Vodjek, there's a book about the bear, very entertaining, you must read it. And it ends up, it stays in Edinburgh Zoo, bored to tears because it couldn't have a beer and fags and nobody spoke Polish to it. But anyway, I thought you'd just like that story just to uh, one of these things. Eh? This is a great hero of mine, Marguerite Garden, who lived in Lanark. Marguerite was a great person. I met her through environmental stuff. She was very interested in the full supply and so on. Um, got to know and got to know about her uh, heroic exploits. As a teenager in Brittany, she was uh, a passionate uh, person uh, who gave her all to help to secure the liberty of France. Her whole family played an important part, despite the fact that German officers were actually staying in their house. But they did survive uh, the war, except I think one of her brothers uh, died in the fighting at the latter end of the war. But um, she, uh, it was a while before she got the Légion d'honneur. And you know, she was, 
the highest decorated woman in the whole of Scotland. Her hobby was a surgeon, uh, Mr. Garden. Made, he was quite an interesting guy. Uh, Marguerite fell in love with him and his tank and abandoned her uh, studies of fine arts in Paris and uh, came here to uh, Scotland. Had quite a reasonable sized family, chiefly boys. Uh, I remember them, they were great cricketers. Um, and I remember a daughter went to Jacqueline and went to live in New Zealand. Amazing story. Equally, um, here we see some of the German prisoners at Harpen Den, and this is uh, one of the um, prisoner of war letters, but it sent actually this one, uh, I think was, yeah, I think it was actually sent during the war to Hamburg, um, uh, and uh, Rolf uh, Albers was asking after his family and hoping the war would be over soon. I've read this is loud. A lot of them were not, the vast majority were not tarred with the Nazi brush, but you had to be careful what you said. Um, I know a couple of the guys in this, I think they're in this photograph, um, ditched their Dornier in Scotland because they didn't want to go to the Russian front. So they thought Scotland was a, be a great place to uh, spend the war. And one of them then married an Italian uh, here. Interesting story. These these guys, some of them, when the war ended, didn't want to go to their, uh, back to what is East Germany and indeed cried because they didn't want to leave Scotland. Uh, same with the Italians. I think there was a camaraderie, which we often forget, which was brought about by war and human understanding. Some of these guys may have gone on the trip to Lanark Racecourse in a German staff car, which they'd renovated. It must have been some site there. And here are some more recent things of looking at just uh, a nuclear bunker, which you can see the lights on, operated by British Telecom. This is uh, on the road. Uh, from Carstairs Village to Carstairs Junction. This is a nuclear bunker for communications. The other thing is a dead bus. It's next to the um, uh, church at uh, Carstairs Village. Put this in because this is some of the sort of curiosities that we're looking for to and you know, try and interest, uh, interest you in, might be mom, but it's still part of our history. History covers a long period. So I'll put in a picture of one of our uh, volunteers. David is now in a care home, but this was such a good picture. I just couldn't resist showing you a picture of David posing with his camera. Uh, near uh, one of the bridges. I uh, I think, I don't, this is not um, not Heinford Bridge. I think it was uh, uh, Garion. Uh, it's really quite interesting uh, picture. I remain to be correct on that one. Well, we're coming to the end of uh, the, the talk now, folks. Um, how can you help? Well, we're working on two books. The names are here. And if you want to help, here's the email address. And we also now have 
a phone number. And here is the phone number and you can leave a message. And if you want to make a contribution, drop in a check of cash in 12 hour. Better still join the society for a dinner. Uh, this, um, you know, thanks to people's support, we're able to bring history to the community and through these times I must thank especially the dedicated team who have been involved in Facebook, Mary Ann Patrick, her husband Adam Patrick and Ian Murray, our treasurer and uh, these people have helped keep the show on the road. Next Zoom meeting, that's on the 8th of March, so uh, you'll be notified about that. Okay. About 7.30. And here is how our work is supported. And the third point down is the most important of all the volunteers and members. So I'm going to stop the share now and go to the chat. Uh, right, Graham. In answer to the chat, yeah, I think there were, must have been some scarping of the land there to create that uh, pronounced mound. As to the Lee Penny, uh, I don't know when the Lee Penny last saw the uh, light of day. Uh, what I was going to say is, uh, I will, uh, I, I don't, you can unmute yourselves if you like, and you can, you can speak, putting up your hand in the usual manner, and that will be that. Okay, hope you've all enjoyed it. Unmute yourselves. Thanks very much, Ed. Oh, it's a pleasure. Most enjoyable. Thank you. Remember, remember to send me the list and I'll circulate it down here. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm going to go now because I haven't eaten since lunchtime. Oh, will you be dying for some food, Eric? I am indeed, but thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I dropped out twice. Uh, I don't know why. I think the signal failed, but you let me back in, thank goodness. But uh, uh, there we are. Thank you. Does anybody else have a problem, by the way? I don't think no, so. No, 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 no. It may have been the uh, microwave behind me, although it wasn't working at the time. <laughs> the the microwave, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> No. Lucky you didn't get fried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Good night. night yes, Ken. Um, I did put something in chat, but I don't think it got there. Um, that was a question about the, the present venue of the statue um, from the Lee. Was that the Lee that ended up in... It, I, it was Kong. sold. I don't know where it is. Yeah. I saw I it do a search there. on uh, online. You might find it, but I think my own view was that it shouldn't have been sold and it shouldn't have left the area and it should have been kept in the area because pieces of 17th century uh, garden statuary are exceedingly rare. 
Yeah, I was shown it at Cleghorn Main, certainly. That's when I supported it. And it obviously moved from when Cleghorn House was demolished in 1957. It ended up down the road a bit. I got the impression it was, what's her name? What did you call her? Sylvia? Um, who showed me that? Oh, yeah. And she didn't want anybody really to... Well, I didn't want me to see, you know, I'd been there and seen it, but, you know, now that it's gone, well, one can see that, as a she, of course, but um, I just wondered if anybody knew where it had ended up, but that looks like there's no answer to that. No, I'm afraid not. Okay. Anybody else want to ask a question? Yes, Ed, that was very enjoyable and interesting. Thanks very much. Um, has anybody been ever explored Carnwath Mott with geophys or anything to see if there is a stone tower or indeed anything else inside it? Well, I've walked up to the top and I think there probably is. Um, there's an interesting story about the top of it. On, and that's if anybody starts digging. Um, They'll get struck by lightning. I took a, a group up to the top of it. Uh, when I was younger and fit, I wouldn't like to try it today. It is hell of a steep. And we had a dog with us and the dog started digging. And then there was a clap of thunder. So it's all true. <laughs> yes, yes. If, if in doubt, print the legend. <laughs> well, I thought you'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No, oh, that's really, really good. Shall I leave a little? That's interesting. Thanks again from me, Ed, as well. That was great. Okay, then I'll. Uh,